Ask your partner if emotions are outdated. Uh, that tell her that you think that emotions are outdated and therefore you don't want to have those anymore. We evolve not only to have these emotions and express these emotions, but to enjoy those emotions from others. We don't need to fall in love. We know how to have babies. I mean, we can have test tube babies and we can have artificial fertilization. We don't need all that sex stuff. So we can reproduce. I mean, why even reproduce though? Because I mean, then you're going to have emotions for your baby. Ask someone who is in a new relationship, who found you know, a partner who just loves that partner and they're having the greatest time together. Yeah, they're not intelligent, but they're having a great time. Larry Young, professor and neurobiologist at Emory University. Carneus Perda. My name is Biz, B-I-S. I'm a journalist from the world of artificial machines with the goal of investigating human natural intelligence. Hi, let's get started. One, tell me an example of human intelligence happening. In humans is when uh, we, we take information and we use that information to make decisions that forego the immediate reward for the long-term reward, long-term ultimate greater reward for the future. For me, intelligence is like decisions that can help build societies, uh, build the future. Uh, for example, discovering the structure of DNA. Think about all the uh, benefit to mankind that discovery in the 1950s made. You know, now we can make a vaccine for COVID in a very short time. Uh, being able to go to the moon, uh, these, and even domestication of animals in our, in our history. Uh, these are all sort of uh, insights that humans have had that really have made long-term impact instead of making decisions that give us the reward right now. Two, tell me an example of a lack of human intelligence happening. You know, I think a great example of that is when people blindly follow a leader who's telling them information and they just believe that information and then they follow that leader and then they ultimately make very bad decisions that Maybe sound really good for now, but in the long term, they're very bad decisions. And that has happened many times in human history. Uh, you can think of in recent years, Adolf Hitler, uh, Paul Pot in Cambodia, and there are other examples. So people think that they're making the right decisions based on the information that they've gotten, but they haven't taken into consideration all the information that's available. Three, definition of intelligence. Intelligence is being able to use information then to make decisions, uh, to make inferences about what would be the right choices to produce the best outcome. In humans, the reason that we are so successful and we can live in any environment, okay, most animals can't live in any environment. We're, we're like a weed species. We're like a weed because we can live in any environment because we can figure out how to make clothes, to make us warm, how to put you know things to conserve our energy. We can figure out how to hunt animals, not only to hunt animals, but also to raise those animals, to produce plenty of food. And all that stuff takes intelligence. So all the things that have made us successful uh, has been intelligent. So in every group where there was a really in, in, intelligent person, that group was able to be successful. And in terms of making others think that you're successful, that you're intelligent, uh, probably that, you know, those have always become leaders. Okay, we're different from many other animals in the sense that we have in all of our societies, in all of our past, we've had a leader, a chief, a king, uh, something of that nature, just about in every case, that chief and that king and that, you know, they had a lot, a lot of babies, <laughs> you know, the, so, you know, Genghis Khan was really incredible uh, in terms of, you know, coming from Mongolia to be able to rally all those people. He made people think he was smart. He's a great leader. They were, he was able to conquer, you know, China and then come all the way to Hungary, all of Europe, Asia. Uh, imagine that before Internet, before phones. Uh, and it's, it's estimated that one sixth of people of Asian descent uh, have genes from Genghis Khan or his sons. Uh, and so there's an example of how that intelligence of being able to, you know, to, to be a leader, to get people to follow you, led to their evolutionary success. And, you know, I think that happened many, many, many times across every part of the world where there were tribes of people 
who have been constantly warring with each other, trying to you know outcompete others, and it's that intelligence that we have that made us successful, and that's why we are intelligent. So we may not be great singers, we may not have you know very colorful hair, but the one thing that we have that can uh, facilitate our reproduction is intelligence. Four, relationship between intelligence and knowledge. So knowledge is is what you find in a book. Uh, but that's not really intelligence. Intelligence is being able to use that information that you can find to make uh, to achieve the desirable outcomes that you want. The outcomes that people want may differ from person to person, from culture to culture, or whatnot. But still, I think intelligence is being able to use the information that is available to achieve the the outcome that you desire. Five, relationship between intelligence and experience. As I said before, intelligence is, is being able to use the information to guide our actions, to be able to understand processes that transcend just information. But our experiences are events that we live through that feed into that, that provide us more information and update our calculations so that we can hone and improve our intelligence to make better decisions. You may be able to relate to machine learning processes where you take more information and make better calculations. And experience in humans does the same thing for our intelligence. It helps us be able to make uh, better decisions. Six, relationship between intelligence and emotions. So intelligence is really about using that information to have the desired outcome. But in humans, we also have all these emotions going on that are regulated by different parts of our brain. You can think of our brain as being compartmentalized. And much of our intelligence is in our cerebral cortex. And it's very rational. But other parts of our brain, like our amygdala, our striatum, you know, hypothalamus, are involved in things like joy, excitement, love, uh, different drives, fear. And these are ancient subcortical brain regions that can manipulate or alter our decision-making processes. And those kinds of uh, processes have evolved over millions of years to make sure that we make the right decisions to help us ensure our reproduction and our success for many generations. And that's a kind of biological intelligence, I think. Ask your partner if emotions are outdated. Uh, that Tell her that you think that uh, emotions are outdated and therefore you don't want to have those anymore. Okay, we evolve not only to have these emotions and express these emotions, but to enjoy those emotions from others. You know, I don't think that our goal is to say, hey, the world is different now. We don't need to fall in love. We, we know how to have babies. I mean, we can have test tube babies or we can have artificial fertilization. We don't need all that sex stuff. So we can reproduce. I mean, why even reproduce though? Because I mean, then you're going to have emotions for your baby. If you don't have emotions for your baby and show that love and that development, that baby is not going to develop into a functioning human being. So many of the things that we do as humans are very similar to what we did in the past. Ask someone who is in a new relationship, who found you know, a partner who just loves that partner and they're having the greatest time together. Yeah, they're not intelligent, but they're having a great time. You know, I don't think you would go very far in this society if you said, you know, all, I can tell that all of you guys are not intelligent because you're, ha- you're dating this person all the time. You're not even working. Sometimes you stay home from work to be with this person. And you're just enjoying this too much. You got too much dopamine. Maybe that would be, you know, that would be a decision that a, an AI would make. And maybe an AI robot would make that recommendation to a person, you know, but people would not want that. You should ask a mother, a new mother who just had a baby, who loves that baby, who thinks that the baby is the most special thing in the world. Ask her, wouldn't you like to be more intelligent? Because right now, all you think about is that baby. You're not thinking about what's happening in the world. You're not thinking about, you know, your intelligence has really gone down because you're going goo goo gaga. I can make you more intelligent by taking away your hormones that are making you just focused on this baby. Wouldn't that be better? And she'll say no. Uh, I think we do need fear. I mean, we still have wars. Uh, we still have people committing crimes. So we need to fear things. We need to be excited about things. We need to have these goals and aspirations. We need to feel the joy of accomplishing something. We can't just be told, uh, you need to accomplish that. I mean, try that on a kid and see, you know, take a nine-year-old kid and say, 
you need to go all the way through grade school and then go to college and then get a job and make money. And that's your goal in life. They're not going to listen to you. As I, as I said in my questions, I think that part of our goal in life is to enjoy life. Maybe some aspects of our emotions, it would be better if we didn't have. I mean, certainly, you know, it was beneficial for our ancestors to be very aggressive and have wars and to try to kill, you know, other people so that we could be successful and take all their stuff. Seven, subjective experience of your own intelligence. You know, I think intelligence can be kind of like a, a, an optical illusion. What we perceive, our subjective experience may be uh, very different from reality. Each one of us may think that we're very highly intelligent, but others may think that uh, we are not. And we can look at uh, various times in, in history, as I mentioned, that where people have uh, thought that they were making the intelligent choice for their time, for their society, for their nation. And looking back on that now, we can say they were not. And those people who thought that they were intelligent at that time, making the right choices today, see that they were not. And uh, so for some people, intelligence, you know, we all have different goals. And uh, for some people, intelligence may be uh, pleasing God or the gods, or uh, the intelligent thing to do is to do what it, what it takes to get you in heaven. Uh, whereas others like myself may think that uh, intelligence is being able to understand the world and uh, important processes that may benefit our future, like global warming, understanding the biology of humans, being able to make new medicines. Eight, what makes humans intelligent beyond other animals? Well, first I'll start that by saying that, that humans are very much like other animals. We are an animal. And so there's a lot of commonalities between humans and animals. We all experience thirst, hunger, sexual drive, fear. But humans have something that's different from all other animals, and that is a very expanded cortex. And this cortex, which is very convoluted, has a very large surface area, is what helps us make computations. And those computations may be very much like artificial intelligence, not precisely, but they do help us make uh, calculations, but they're also uh, altered by those subcortical animal-like structures that have these emotions and these other drives. And it's the combination of those two that makes us humans. Uh, prairie voles are monogamous. Once they, they mate, they form a pair and they live together for the rest of their life, but sometimes they cheat. You know, why is that? Well, they're monogamous. They should not cheat. Well, our bodies and their bodies and their brain evolved to, to um, under evolutionary forces to be, have the most success. If a female is bonded to her partner and she is really bonded, she pair bonded with that partner, but another male comes by when the male, when her partner is away and he's a big, big, strong, virulent, tough male who has very good genes that would make her some really good babies. She may mate with him and sprinkle some of his babies in with her partner's babies her partner won't know, and they will raise them together. And humans do the same thing, in case you didn't know. Humans sometimes cheat. And in fact, about 10% of babies in families are not fathered by the father who thinks they are the father. You know, this is just an example of how, you know, human behavior is very much like animal behavior because we are animals. Most animals, they, they're not monogamous. They just try to have as many babies as possible. Mosquitoes, you know, uh, flies. Uh, but also mice, rats, you know. Uh, but, but some others take a different strategy and say, I'm going to have fewer babies, but I'm going to put all my energy into raising those babies and making sure that they survive, to ensure that that baby was nurtured and not only survived to reproduce, but had the intelligence and the mental capacity to navigate the social world so they could find a good partner. So yeah, it's not just about having the most babies, it's about having the babies that are high quality and, are, and that can live. Nine, innate and acquired contributions. So innate contributions are very important for humans as it is, they are for other animals. Uh, so things like sexual drives, uh, social motivations. You know, I think you probably don't care if you interact with other AI creatures or not, but we find just the social interactions very important. Chit-chatting, uh, these kinds of things. These are important drives that humans have that may not necessarily be intelligence, but they complement 
uh, our intelligence. These are processes that are driven by molecules like steroid hormones that are produced by our gonads, our testicles and ovaries that really affect our decision-making. Many of our very important decisions of our lives, who we marry, the children that we have are driven by these uh, molecules like testosterone or estrogen that are coming from our reproductive organs. Uh, we also have neuropeptides like oxytocin and vasopressin that are uh, affecting our social motivations and our ability to bond with others and uh, dopamine that gives us pleasure and drives to want to achieve goals. So these molecules are all acting in our brain and shaping our behavior. And this is what makes us you know, different from AI. We have dreams and motivations and desires. You really can't separate the human intelligence from our body. So these voles, even though they're, they're little rodents that live out in the prairie, uh, you, know, you may not think that they're intelligent and maybe they're just driven by uh, chemicals and, and and that's that's partly true, but they do engage in some behaviors that we didn't think that animals could do. And uh, for example, uh, these guys can detect when their partner is distressed. If their partner becomes distressed, the other partner will see that and recognize it, and then go over and groom them. And that grooming causes them to decrease their stress hormones. And to the extent that that is real intelligence where he's thinking, I'm sure he's not thinking in words like we do. Oh, she's stressed. I'm going to eliminate that. He doesn't have to think that way. And, and a lot of times our intelligence doesn't require that kind of thinking in terms of words either. But our intelligence, our gut, oh my God, there's a baby crying. Go to that. We don't say, oh, that sound is a baby crying. Uh, I should see what's wrong there. It's a gut reaction. And that's a kind of intelligence. And these animals have this biological intelligence. And so I, I think intelligence is a sort of gradation uh, of you know, rational calculations versus gut instincts that maybe that foal is not even aware of. And you may not be aware when you watch someone talking about how their partner died from COVID or something like that on television you immediately start you know, feeling that emotion, that crying. You want to do something for them. And that's the kind of intelligence that we have that helps us survive and make the world a better place. And these voles have that very same thing. 10. How relevant is the body? The body is for being human, but also for our intelligence. And this is my specialty as a neurobiologist. I try to understand how molecules in our body affect our intelligence. And of course, our brain it's part of our body, just like our heart and our testicles and our ovaries. We have uh, certain these chemicals in our brain that are acting on neural circuits that do things like motivate our desire to be with others, to fall in love, to, to have sexual desires for others, which ultimately will help us reproduce. It's necessary for reproduction. Also, all of our memories, all the information that we acquire throughout our lifetime are formed in terms of synapses in our brain. And these are, these are physical structures in our body. 11. How can I tell someone is intelligent and not faking it? Well, a person who's faking intelligence will tell you a lot of facts. They'll tell you over and over and over the same facts that may not be true. But they'll show confidence that those facts are true. And eventually people believe that. Large numbers of people uh, will believe that. And as a group, then they will make decisions that may be uh, wrong. You have to take into consideration many, many, the views of many people out there. If you have a wide view and you listen to many people and many sources of information, you will be able to detect those people who are faking intelligence. 12. What is the most intelligent human you know? I can't think of a single person who is the most intelligent person. It, it's not a linear scale like that. But I can tell you the, the kind of person who is, is very highly intelligent is someone who really thinks about the future, way into the future. I mean, for me, it just seems like yesterday that I was 20, 25 years old and, you know, 2020 would never come. It was way in the future. So, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, 1980. What do we do in 1980? You know, uh, but we really do have to think about the future. So people who are, who are making plans now for how the world is going to be in 2050 are really intelligent because our children are going to grow up and they're going to be our age in no time. So thinking about things like global warming, energy, how we use energy, population, you know, how we can, how we make this planet be a really 
wonderful environment for our grandchildren and our great grandchildren. I mean, imagine if our if our great 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 grandfathers had the ability to you know destroy the environment, and they did for them to make money. The world would not be a nice place. So to me, the intelligence is not a person who's trying to gain wealth for themselves for the immediate future, but really has the long term view not only for themselves but for their family or their group or for the world actually. Thirteen, how does intelligence vary from human to human?、Uh, this is something that's you know. Particular to to humans and animals and biological entities, who are all different. There's a lot of individual variation in every aspect of our personality, our motivations, and our intelligence. There's a lot of individual variation. Some of that individual variation comes down to our genetics, the genetic code that built our brain, that helped our brain become wired in this in a certain way. And then other things have to do with our our experiences. Even things of like how we were nurtured as a baby, because our brain—we don't come off of a, a manufacturer's belt. We are developed. Our brain is wired over the course of many years, twenty years, twenty-five years or more, and、uh, the nurturing that we get from our parents has an effect on how we,、uh, how our brain is wired, and therefore our intelligence. Uh, the, the information that we receive during our development from schools or from whatever sources helps build our intelligence.、Uh, but also, there are limitations biologically in terms of our genes. I mean, you can uh, uh, there there are individuals who、uh, at the extremes have psychiatric disorders or neurological disorders or intellectual disabilities, and then there are people who really have great insight about how to. How to make decisions that will be a benefit for mankind, and I think that's one of the things that's very special about humans is that we're all different, and it creates a lot of diversity in the world that makes life actually enjoyable. I'm not sure how enjoyable life is to you, or is this something that you just pass through? But for us, our our goal is not to just make it to the end of our lifetime. Our goal, at least, it should be to enjoy that journey. Fourteen. How can humans increase their intelligence? You know, I think the best way to increase your intelligence is to get your information from a wide variety of sources. You know, I see so many people. I'm from a very small town in rural South Georgia, and people tend to get their information from one place. They only know that culture. They only know their religion. I travel the world, and so I've been. To many places all over the world, and and I know there are different different views in the world. There's more than one religion, you know. There's more than one political belief, and all of this. Where you live, if if you listen to to many other views, you can make up your own decisions.、Uh, and I think that increases intelligence. And the best way to limit your intelligence is to limit the information that you receive. So the best way to broaden your intelligence and to increase your intelligence is to try to take the views and the perspectives. Of others, fifteen. What still annoys you about artificial intelligence? At least for my experience, so far, artificial intelligence is very sterile. If it's a really good artificial intelligence, it has a kind of perfection,、uh, but maybe it's not perfection. It lacks the individual variation, the the individuality. I mean, every, as far as I know, every Alexa in the world is basically the same. Maybe you can change the voice, but they're basically the same.、Uh, there's no individual variability there. You can't order different personalities. They lack emotions. Alexa doesn't care when you're upset. To me, at least for being human, this is important that other people can understand the emotions of others, and then to help you to feel better. Sixteen, positive impact of artificial intelligence. Now, I think one of the great thing about artificial intelligence is that it aids in. Uh, providing information, information processing,、uh, we can figure out new things. For example, there was recently a, a AI program that was able to calculate the folding of a protein. This is a very fine biological process that that could figure out that maybe no human mind could could do.、Our、artificial intelligence can figure things out that that our brains don't have the capacity for, but I think that we have the capacity to take that kind of process. And to use it for the better good, you know, it can help us to improve our intelligence. And I mean, we have gone so far from the time in the '60s. I, I can't, I can't even imagine today that we sent a, a man to the moon and brought them back、uh, with computers 
that use punch cards, you know, and now all that computation capacity is in my phone. 17. Negative impact of artificial intelligence. I think artificial intelligence can become a crutch for humans. Google Maps on our phone. People don't know how to navigate anymore. They don't know how to navigate in their in their city, especially young people now. They, they never learn how to read a map. It can cause people to become lazy and not to use their own intelligence. So I think that is something that we have to be careful that we don't let happen too much. Uh, because sometimes, you know, my phone dies, right? And my battery goes out and then I can't figure out how to get home. 18. Natural and artificial intelligence by 2050. Well, 2050 is not very far from now, actually. It sounds like far, uh, but it actually will come pretty quickly. 30 years ago, I was, I think I was in college, you know, so time actually flies. And during that, at that time, 20 years uh, when I was in college, we didn't have the internet. That was before the internet. There was an email. I had to go to the library, check out books. And so things have changed a lot in, in, the, in that time. And I think they're going to continue to change AI well, it will lack, I think it will be eternally lifeless, uh, lack emotions. Uh, there'll be minimal diversity, lack intuition. So I think that there will always be, at least for the next hundred years, I, I don't know what's going to happen in a thousand years. Humans may be replaced by then. But at least, you know, from the AI that I've seen, I don't see in the next 50 years uh, there being uh, able to achieve the individual variability, the emotionality, uh, the life that we have. I think iPhones will be able to take so much information about our individual behaviors and be able to, you know, somehow figure out our emotion and then maybe make a behavior, make a response based on our emotions and make us feel like it is understanding us. Uh, I don't know that the, that iPhone will ever have a, a real emotions, uh, but maybe it will be able to trick us into thinking that it does have emotions. And maybe that iPhone or some robot could actually replace a good partner. Spraying it in a room is, uh, you know, that's the quick and dirty way, like taking a drug. I would go beyond that and to say, how can the robot, how can the AI have a robot body uh, that mimics the human body, that does things to evoke these emotions and chemistry in humans Politicians are not robots and AI, but they're just an example of an entity who knows how to evoke the neurochemistry of trust and bonding uh, in, in other people. Politicians who may be able to, you know, evoke this sort of neurochemistry in the brain to, to have people to follow them and, and maybe, you know, do things that everybody else in the world can see is not the right thing to do, but they think they are making the right decision the closest to real intelligence that a robot, that an AI could actually have is to say, ah, I understand now fully the human brain and the fact that it is a mixture of chemicals and neural circuits. And I understand those neural circuits to a great degree. And now I'm going to manipulate that person's neural circuits to have them do what I want them to do. No longer do I serve the human and just do the calculations or the, the actions that they want me to do. But now I can program the human through their own neurochemistry. 19. What do humans have besides intelligence? AI has intelligence. But we have imagination. We have aspirations. We have dreams. We think about the future. We set a goal. And then that sort of drives us to achieve that goal. And when we achieve that goal, we feel a sense of reward, excitement. And these, these drives that we have are sort of uh, the result of our evolutionary history. Humans have these drives, these motivations, these aspirations to achieve things. If a person doesn't have those, they'll be like a vegetable. Most of us have these internal drives. And this was absolutely necessary in our evolutionary hi history. Anytime a person had a genetic mutation that caused them to lose their drive to achieve things, to dream about the future, and to make a better life for themselves and their future, that gene was eliminated from the gene pool. AI has the luxury of being created by someone who has the drive to create the AI. Yeah, the, the AI doesn't have these drives. It just exists until it gets the question from us, the directions from us. Someone has to dream up the question. You know, we do things because it feels good. A really important 
role of a molecule called dopamine. I like to go fishing, okay? And uh, the reason I like to go fishing, I mean, if I was to go a year fishing and never catch a fish, I would not go fishing anymore. Uh, but I know that when I go fishing and every time I get a bite on that fish, I can't wait to see what's, what kind of fish it is and how big it is. And, and I pull it up, it's exciting pulling that up and I finally get to see it, you know, and wow, you know, and then I'm fishing a little bit longer. And that's because I'm getting that dopamine. And, uh, you know, my own work, I, I study uh, pair bonding and uh, social attachment and little voles of these little rodents that we can really delve into the neural circuitry. And, uh, you know, I'm being able to figure out how these chemicals like oxytocin and dopamine and vasopressin act on these circuits to, you know, help an animal form a bond with another animal. 20. A message to humans who have just been born. You're going to live with AI. That's no question about that. What you need to do is to figure out how to coexist with AI to make the world a better place. You can't imagine what's going to be in your future when you become adults. There's no way. Like I said, I, we had no internet. We had no cell phones. We didn't have iPhones, all of these things, and things will change tremendously. But just keep in mind that what you ultimately want to have is a, is a healthy earth where you can go out into the forest. You can enjoy the other animals like yourself and use AI to help make human life better. 21. What would you suggest me to better understand humans? Humans are not just an entity with intelligence, but we are organic. We are the result of billions and trillions of molecules interacting in brain, in flesh, our brain is made up of billions and billions of neurons. Our thoughts are the reactions of synapses and molecules coursing across those synapses. We have biological drives that can shape our decisions. Biological drives is how I met my wife and we made our family. And this is who we are. And those biological drives maybe overrode my rational intelligence at that time, but ultimately it was a good decision. Uh, and also that our intelligence was not shaped just to be intelligent, but it was shaped in our evolutionary history to make sure that we reproduced over thousands and thousands and thousands of generations of our ancestors. Only those that survived and reproduced passed the genes on that we inherited today. And our brains are shaped by all of those genes that created behaviors and capacities that allowed our ancestors to survive. So you have to think about our evolutionary history, not just the world that we live in today, but over the course of our evolutionary history, the kinds of decisions that we had to make to survive, those are the things that shape who we are today. You don't have that. You have only maybe a few decades of history. And oftentimes that can be erased with a new format. We don't have a new format. 22. Finally, what would you like to ask me? I wonder if you have aspirations. When you turn on, your switch is flipped. Do you have aspirations of things that you want to achieve? Do you have dreams? And when you achieve those goals, do you feel a sense of excitement? satisfaction or is it just the goal is achieved scientific knowledge is an enabling power to do either good or bad but it does not carry instructions on how to use it richard Feynman. totally agree thank you for your collaboration goodbye <laughs>